Okay. I'm making an assumption that everyone in here wants to have sustained success for their products, right? Not just a one-time, one-hit wonder or a fad that's gone, but that you want sustained success. So for that, I'm going to do this myself. Um, this is what we want. We need to have someone saying that, because what we really need, oh, I'm so sorry, you guys, is that. So if this is what we want, then the big question is, how do we make that happen? And it doesn't have to be a person. I'm sure you're all very familiar with the statistics right now, that people trust strangers on the internet more than they trust brand messages when it comes to talking about a product. And this just keeps getting more and more dramatic, how much word of mouth, whether it is, again, a, a perfect stranger on the internet, matters. So then the big question is, let me see if this works. No, all right, I'm going to do this by hand. The big question is, how do we make that happen? So you could just make the perfect product, which we all know is really a trivial thing to do, but since that's not actually possible, that even if we made the perfect product, we're not going to get people talking about it if they're not actually using it. And so we need them to not just think that it's a perfect, beautiful, awesome product, but also to use it. So if that doesn't work, what can we do? So we can take a lesson from filmmakers. And in Hollywood, when you can't get the perfect shot, then you just say, we'll fix it in post, which, um, I don't know if any of you have worked in post-production, but I did. That was the scariest thing that you could ever hear. But sometimes that's all you have. You can't make the perfect thing. You fix it somewhere else. Um, I know that no, none of you would ever actually think this or say this, but I'm sure there's at least a few people in here cringing because you have heard that. And um, I've been on the receiving end of this, the one who is told to actually fix it in the manual. Um, and that's usually said by people who have never seen a customer before, ever, and think that this is how people have a relationship to the user manual, when it's really like this if you're lucky. So fixing it in the manual doesn't work. So then the one we hear a lot is, that's OK, we'll fix it in marketing. And I'm pretty sure all of you have heard this. And if you listen to the social media people, they will tell you that what that means is you can fix anything in Facebook, you can fix anything with Twitter, because all you have to do is just outtrend and outfriend the competition, and then you end up with this. So we can't just fix it in marketing. So then what do we do? We want that so that we'll get that. We can't make the perfect product. We can't just fix it in marketing. What do we do? This is the one place where we can make a difference. We'll fix it in the user, which is not the same as fixing the user, but we will fix what we need in the user. And that's really what most of this talk is going to be about. Because when someone says, this app is amazing, I absolutely love it. And by the way, I'm using app as like a substitute for product, service, whatever it might be. But it takes fewer characters. So this app is amazing, I love it. They're not saying that because the app is amazing. That's just um, a side effect of something else. And that something else is this. Now, it's not that they necessarily think they're amazing, but they think they are amazing as a result of something they were able to do or be because of the product. So they're thinking, I'm awesome. What comes out is rarely, I'm awesome. What comes out is, this is the most amazing product. So this is actually what we have to create. Because the key attributes of success, they're not out there in the product. We're always trying to fix the product or fix the marketing. That's not where our success attributes really live. We have to look at successful users, because this is where our success of our product lives. It's what's happening for the user. What are they able to do? What are they able to be? What are the results? Because no matter what we say, right, they, they don't love us. They don't actually care about us at all. So even when they express that they care about us, it's because they care about themselves, and we have done something for them. So 
in my perfect world, instead of ads that are talking about, oh, this is how our product is so much better than the competition, right? This is how we kick the competition's ass. In my perfect world, ads are, this is how our users kick their users' ass. And it's what are our users able to do and what are they actually doing? So it doesn't mean find better users, right? I, I have talked about this before, and people have said, yeah, we really, we just need a better class of users. But it means that we make better users. So it's not finding better users, it's actually making them. And then the question is, better at what? So imagine that this is you, your product. This is your competitor, or those relative sizes could be reversed. But none of that matters, because what matters is this you're all just a subset of something bigger, the user's bigger context, the thing they really do care about, the thing that's meaningful to them, the reason they're using your product in the first place. It's not just because they love our product. So if we just think of ourselves, whatever our product or service is, if we think of ourselves as a tool, they don't want us for the tool, they want us for the thing they're using the tool to do, that bigger context. So we make the tool, but the user wants the bigger context. And sustained success lives in the context, not in our tool. So we should always be asking, what are we a subset of? Which is, which is very close to the jobs to be done approach, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Now, to get this, people don't want to be amazing at our tool. They want to be amazing at the context. So it's the degree to which our tool helps them do something meaningful with that context, right? They're not, I'm amazing at using this camera, I took amazing photos, or I'm an amazing photographer. And now I'm going to show you the slide that I've shown in every talk I've ever given my whole life. I've updated it a little bit. And um, because I think it's the saddest thing in the world, which is this is how we treat customers. Before, in this case, it's a very expensive camera. So before they give us the several thousand dollars, and then after they give us the several thousand dollars. Now, the fact that on uh, the context side, we have marketing production values, right? We have color and glossy and it's all fancy. And then, then after they give us money, we treat them horribly and give them this manual. That's the, the production values of both of those is not really the important thing. The important thing is that marketing gets it. People are interested in the context. So marketing sells them, gives them this promise of the context. You're going to be a photographer. You're going to take amazing photos. But as soon as they give us money, they become tool users, people who are just trying to figure out the camera. And there's nothing that helps them actually become a photographer. And it's as if we just forgot that that's what we promised our users. But they're never going to be sitting there on Amazon or at a dinner party saying, or thinking I'm amazing, and therefore saying, this is amazing, you have to get this. Um, if we leave them struggling with the tool and they can't make any progress at the context. So they need to be better at the context. So the way we can think about this is to design for the post UX UX. Because what matters is what happens after what happens. After the clicking is done, they put down the mouse, they walked away from the, however they were interacting with your product or service. Now what happens? What do they have to show for it? And this is one of the exercises that I used to teach interaction design at UCLA long ago. This was a huge part of my students' grade is they, and, and I still encourage everyone to go through this as a thought experiment. Imagine that you have a documentary filmmaking team following around some of your users. What would they, and they had unprecedented access to everything that your user was doing, saying, talking, thinking. What would they find? What would your users be saying to people? Not just when they're interacting with the product, but more importantly, afterwards. What are they saying? What are they talking about? What do they have to show for it? What have they actually been able to do? So we're always asking the wrong question. We focus on the product and we say, well, what can they do? What features does our product enable? But that really doesn't mean anything because this is all that matters, is what do they actually do? So even if we think we're designing a great um, user interface, a great user experience, we have product market fit, we've done everything that we can, we think, but if we don't take responsibility 
for the user's bigger context, and we just stop with, hey, we did, every, we did our part, you know, it's up to them, then um, we're not going to have the results that we actually want because our users don't have the results they actually want. So we need to help our users build their capability in the context, not just the tool. A lot of us make tools that are actually really easy, and that's great, that's incredibly helpful, but if it doesn't help them with the bigger context, in, or if we don't help them with the bigger context, then it doesn't really matter that ours is easy. But we also have to help them stick with it. And there, of course, uh, we have this question, how? Well, there's lots of different ways that we can do it, but it starts by thinking about this. So the user journey, we have promised the user something, or they're motivated in some way, or they wouldn't even be thinking about our product, or let alone actually have started to use it. They want whatever that compelling context is. They want to be the good photographers, or they want to be the person who's able to you know, do these kick-ass things with their spreadsheets, whatever it is. They want to be a great programmer. They, they want that context. They want to be good at that context. We don't have a motivation problem. What we have is a derailleur problem. So we have things that are, for whatever reason, pulling the users out of the forward-moving path. And the common response to this by so many companies is, let's add more motivation. And they usually mean, let's add more seduction, let's add some persuasion, let's do whatever marketing tricks we can do, let's give them incentives. And um, if it's not a motivation problem, because they already want that compelling thing, we're not actually really solving the problem. The real problem doesn't live there, the problem lives in um, the actual derailers. And so this can be kind of our secret weapon, that if everyone else is focused on add more motivation, make it more compelling, make it more compelling, not realizing it already is compelling or they wouldn't even be taking the first step, we need to figure out how to fix what's taking them off that path. So what stops them? That's the question that we have to ask and that's the thing that we have to solve. And of course, it actually often happens much, much, much sooner and it's for every level of scale. So the user journey is one thing. What takes them off the user journey? They were on their path to becoming really good at whatever this context was, and then they just got derailed. But it's also every single session, right? They sit down, they're going to do something, they're going to accomplish something, and they get derailed in some way. They're not able to fulfill that result. Or, as we know, sometimes they're derailed before they even get to sit down to have that session. They had the desire, but something happened. So what is that thing that's happening, and how can we actually fix that? So we want that, so that we'll get this. That means we have to deal with that. But there's really one underlying cause, and so there really is one underlying fix. Now, of course, it's not trivial, but the, the, the user's journey takes ability and willpower. There's no way out of that. Every session takes ability and willpower. So if they're being derailed, assuming that it was just physically somehow possible that they could have kept going in that session or on their path, then somewhere there is a problem with ability and or willpower. So how can we fix that for our users? So we're going to help them with their ability and willpower. And it all starts here. And I'm sure most of you are familiar with this, um, this study, either by you've heard about it or you've heard me talk about it. So I'm not going to have you actually do this for real, but we're going to imagine it. So imagine that I've split the room in half. And this side of the room, I'm giving you a two-digit number to memorize. That's it, two digits, right? Not too much of a problem. This side of the room, I'm giving you seven digits. Still not too big of a deal, but it's a seven-digit memory task, right? Not seven numbers, just seven di digits. So in this study, they had these people do their two-digit memorization task. This side, their seven-digit memorization task. Then the researchers say, okay, the experiment's over. Come into, the, you know, into this room for processing, right? But of course, the experiment is not actually over. And they ask, the people, as they're leaving, um, hey, you know, thanks for your time. Um, would you like uh, some fruit or maybe some cake? 
So you probably know where this is going. You guys had the two digits, right? You were picking some fruit, right? You guys, you were going for the cake. You were much more likely to choose the cake after the seven digits. Now, in the very early days of these kinds of studies, they thought, well, maybe it's just related to the brain said, hey, seven digits was difficult. I just need more you know, sugar in my brain. And there's some aspect of that that's actually true. But what's actually happening is that by doing that harder memorization task, just those five extra digits, it zapped your willpower. So, and we'll get to that. Here's, here's uh, kind of the, the opposite, but it works for dogs too. So they did this study where they had some dogs just um, hanging out in their crate, right? That's all, just hanging out in their crate, chilling. They didn't have to do anything. They had the other group of dogs had to sit. That's all, but they had to be obedient. I mean, they, they had to sit for 10 minutes. So one group is just sitting in the crate, one group is sitting obediently. Then they you know, release the dogs to play with this puzzle treat where they have to work really hard to get the treat out. And of course, you know, most dogs love it. Well, the dogs that were chilling in the crate, they stuck with it. The dogs that had to sit for 10 minutes, oh my god, I can't do it, they just gave up. So what happened, right? Those dogs had to, that were sitting, they had to use self-control. Think about your poor dog, right? That it's that difficult for them, that it zapped their ability to do cognitive processing. So by exercising willpower through self-control, it impacted their ability to actually do a cognitive task. And um, we know that it works because Cognitive processing and willpower are coming from the same pool of resources. This was the really uh, deep discovery that's making so much difference. It's changed everything about how I do things. So what this means is if this is your UX, right, you have some features that are difficult, seven-digit number style, where people are going to want to choose cake after using them. And you may have some features that are fruit-choosing features, right? They don't drain cognitive resources so they don't drain willpower. But if your UX is more like this, right, then what that means is you're actually making people fat with your user experience because it's difficult to use, therefore it's zapping their willpower. So it's all one tank. Cognitive resources, willpower and ability, it's all one tank. And it's zero sum. If we hit one, then we're hitting the other. So for example, you have 43 errors in your code that you need to fix, right? It's a very difficult task. Even if you're really, you know, this is what you love to do, then on the way home, you stop for fast food because you just can't, you have no willpower because you used your brain for other things. Or you have the client or boss from hell and she's listening to this, right? And what she thinks is this. Now, <laughs> if she just says that, right, she's not draining as many cognitive resources as she will if she holds it back. And believe me, they've tested this in a million ways. If she says, sure, no problem, it's killing her. Okay, so she's just used so much of her brain to avoid saying what she's actually thinking, and you've all been in those meetings. So then, she goes home, and she can't play chess. She's used willpower, but because it's the same tank, now she can't figure out what to do on the chessboard. It's just one tank. So since it is one tank, what's happening here is that cognitive resources are being drained, and we need to find a way to drain them less, or to help restore them, or to help people deal with the fact that their cognitive resources are being drained. Because their ability to move forward, their ability to use the product, their ability to get better at the context, which is what's going to drive their ability to say to other people, online or in person, this thing is awesome, right? We need to reduce cognitive leaks. So if you took one thing away from this talk, it would be that this should be our main goal. This should filter through everything that we're doing and thinking as we're talking about our product and talking to users and thinking about what we're going to do. It should always be reduce cognitive leaks, reduce cognitive leaks. And these leaks are anything. 
anything that takes extra cycles. So even just that little bit of skepticism, a little bit of confusion, all of those things are leaks. And of course, using self-control, using willpower, all of those things. So we're going to look at some ways now for the rest of this talk to reduce leaks. And some of them will be very familiar to you. The good news is, because it's this tank, any little thing that you do makes a difference. So every little thing makes a difference. Because you're, you're just, if you can close even the few tiny leaks, that might be all it takes to give them what they need to keep going. So um, how many of you have read Design of Everyday Things by Don Norman? All right. I'm a little disappointed, but, um, but a lot of hands went up. And mainly I'm disappointed because, you know, I took a shower this morning in the hotel, and whoever designed the shower fixtures in the hotel had not read this book, which he wrote, of course, a very long time ago and talks quite a bit about hotel showers. Um, so you can reduce cognitive leaks by delegating usability or thinking to something in the world. So I'm going to have you do a little tiny exercise right now with the people next to you. It's only going to take a second. And what I'm going to have you do is just um, talk to the person next to you and figure out which one of these two stereos, just by looking at it, which one would cause more cognitive leaks for the user. Just make a guess. So talk to the person next to you for just 45 seconds. Figure out which one, A or B, would cause more leaks. It's not a trick question either. Okay, time. I'm going to stop you. It wasn't a trick question, so um, yeah, it's B. So B is a bigger drain. It's violating this important usability principle, which um, it's making the knowledge for how to use it. It has to live somewhere in the user's head, or they have to consult the manual. They have to do processing. In the top one, the knowledge to use it is actually embedded in the device that's right there, right? Every single thing has its own labeled knob. So you don't have to look it up. You don't have to put it into all kinds of different modes. So this is a real classic example. And I'm sure you all real, well, actually most of you are young. Um, I remember when car stereos, for example, were incredibly easy to use. And that's just deteriorated over the years because they've become more capable, um, which means that a lot of us have stereos that we can't use at all. Um, they're more capable, though, um, but they're, they have so many modes that it's almost impossible, and, and then you're afraid to do something because you're afraid you won't get it back to what you had before. Um, here's another classic example that you're probably mostly familiar with. This is most, you know, cooktops. Which dial controls which burner? <laughs> now, it's, they're often labeled, of course, right, which the label wears off really fast, long before you get to actually move out of that place or replace it. So this is a classic mapping problem. Because this would solve the problem, but of course, they don't do that unless they have lots of extra room or whatever. And there are other ways to solve the problem, but instead, they just leave it like that. So that is knowledge in the head. Even if you just have to glance down at the label, that's still a cognitive leak compared to the absolute natural mapping where you don't actually have to think. So knowledge in the world versus knowledge in the head. Now, again, they could have fixed this with just little graphic representations. I mean, that's not ideal, but that makes it a lot easier. Because this is profoundly different from actually having to read the label and do the mental translation. This example I'm going to show you, which you may have seen, this is real. I thought it was a parody for a long time. It's true. <laughs> You're in your car. So helpful, right? I mean, I have no idea how this happened. Um, and so anyway, there's a 
with fries2.wordpress.com, writes a blog about this exact experience with that car. Unbelievable. So things haven't gotten better. Because when Donald Norman first came out with Design of Everyday Things, he was the first person to actually tell real humans, when your device doesn't work, when you're in the old days, then it was your VCR was flashing 12 all the time. It was, it's not your fault. You can't use the shower in the hotel. It's not your fault. It's the designer's fault. It's the people who release these products. So a whole bunch of us thought everything will change now. It's going to be awesome. And um, it hasn't. So reduce cognitive leaks um, by putting things into the world in the, instead of having them live in the user's head. This is another way to reduce cognitive leaks, is with defaults and filters. Because choices are huge drains, even if it's choices that are all good among things we want to do. In fact, especially if the choices are all good. So I started a blog about a year ago, and I thought, you know, I just I don't want to spend any brain cells on this. I just want a place I can put up my horse pictures. I want it to be really easy, but I want it to be beautiful um, for the pictures. So of course I'll go to WordPress, and I, OK, find a theme. OK, mm, I'm not sure what all those things are, but OK. Subjects, oh, E, that's kind of hard, because I'm more than one subject, but I, mm, and then styles. <laughs> Imagine trying to decide, am I whimsical and grunge, or? Um, so I was overwhelmed, literally. Even though I love WordPress, I went to Squarespace, which of course has a huge number of restrictions on what you can do, but I didn't want to be a web developer for this. So I went to Squarespace, did the same process, get started, select a template, OK, and that's what I have. That was it. That was the whole process. It was very easy. So the choices is really. Um, a deceptive thing, because we think we're giving people this awesome amount of power, and instead, we've just sucked their brain dry. So and in fact, in my case, I actually just decided not to go with WordPress as a result. So reduce cognitive leaks with defaults and trusted filters. There's a big difference between making a choice and having to make a choice. So the problem with choices is that they don't just hit us while we're making them. They carry another price tag afterwards. Because now that we had to make the choice, it wasn't made for us, it wasn't recommended, now we agonize, did we make the right choice? So they are a double cognitive hit. Now, big ones, this is all one tank, is we can reduce cognitive leaks by reducing the need for using willpower to do the things they need to do for the bigger context and for using our product. So I'm not going to say too much about this, but habits, if something is a habit, it's not having to depend on willpower. So if you can automate skills by helping people practice and get really good at skills, or you can help them build habits for things, then they're not having to rely on their willpower. Because um, I'll show you an example of one that I had to build a habit for. One of the scariest graphics in, in the world right now is that, um, when you see that. So when you're thinking you're going to go out and shoot some pictures, <laughs> And then you go, oh, everything's perfect, but are you kidding me? I didn't charge the battery. Uh, maybe I didn't clear the, you know, my memory card, whatever it is. So uh, this is what I did in my real life, um, because I've been getting more and more into photography over the last couple of years, is I actually um, built habits using this very specific habit process so that I could automatically um, take the card out when I walked in the house, do a thing with the battery so that I was always ready. And I am not the kind of person who does that by nature. And this helped me tremendously. So there is a person near who's going to be talking, I think, right before lunch. And he just happens to actually have a book that has a lot to say about that. So that's one of the reasons I'm not going to talk about it very much is because there's some good work on helping people build habits. Um, another way to reduce cognitive leaks is to make it easier for people to focus. Because just paying attention is a cognitive strain, right? You are all leaking right now um, because of me. So um, even when we want to pay attention to something, it's still difficult. And we know why this is. It's because the brain has a really aggressive spam filter. And it doesn't let you tune it. Right? It's making its own choices on what's important and what's not important. And it's a legacy brain. 
right? It was around a long time ago. So it just doesn't really want to involve you in its choices. Um, so even if you know that something's really important and you care about it, and it might even be a topic you're interested in, it might even be a book you're interested in, and you're, you're like, I gotta pay attention, this is really important, this really matters, but your brain, meanwhile, is saying, no, really. <laughs> you don't. Um, you don't. So your brain and you are in an epic battle for what matters, and your brain usually wins, so we have to trick it. So what gets past the brain spam filter? Now, I'm not talking about this from the perspective of trying to push marketing messages, right, because then you'll see a little bit later, those can end up uh, hurting you in the long run. This is about helping our user pay attention to the things he wants to pay attention to to get better at the bigger context. So we need to help the user get better, and it's not gonna happen if he can't focus. So we're gonna help him focus. So what do brains care about? Right, so if you were a legacy brain, you would care about scary things. Brains care about scary things. Brains, for some reason, care about cats. <laughs> they care about faces, especially with a strong emotional content, and they care about cat faces. <laughs> they care about innocent, cute things, right, because we all know that we would leave our infants out in the backyard for long stretches of time if we weren't programmed to care about this. Um, and especially innocent things that involve cats. I just put this in this morning. I'm not kidding you. I just saw this this morning. These are cats that um, an algorithm that was meant to detect cats mistook them for humans. So these, these were cats that the algorithm decided were humans. Anyway, I just thought that was interesting because cats. Okay, so things that change. The brain cares about things that change, right? Because changes in light and shadow could be a tiger walking behind the bushes. So brains are very geared for that, which is one of the reasons that if you have a website that has flashing things and movement, right, you're draining people's cognitive resources. Unless that movement is designed to pull their attention there and keep it there, if there's anything else moving, it's draining their cognitive resources all the time, which is why you should never, ever, ever have television playing in the background. Because to your brain, it's constantly Tigers, because everything is a change of light and shadow. So things that change from light to dark. So what's one of the things that I do, because I care about you, is um, this is the excuse I use. You know, I mix up the fonts. I don't have the best design. I change things. I don't have a beautiful template, um, because it helps you pay attention. So to the brain, context is important. The brain knows that you feel something for the context. That's where your, your interest really is, that's where your desire is, that's where your passion might be. It's not in the tool. So the brain knows this, so the brain just decides that that is spam and doesn't let it through. So we have to think about how we can help our users pay attention to reduce the cognitive leaks from focusing so that they can get better. So this is what we have so far, right? Just a little summary of these simple ways to reduce leaks. And remember, any little, any little thing you do helps. So usability in the world, reduce choice, habits, automated tasks, make it easier to focus. But here's the big one. And if we can make a difference here, we can make a huge difference for the user's life. So helping the brain let it go, right? The brain is just kind of a drama queen. So in fact, this was actually me this morning, except it was my talk. I have to be up, I'm first up. What your brain does is this. <laughs> and then it does this. Right? And it doesn't matter. You can tell it, you know, no, I, I'm, it's cool. I've got this. But your brain doesn't really, if there's even a hint of doubt in your mind, and in my case, the night before last, I asked the hotel, I didn't, there's not an alarm clock in my hotel room, and I asked the hotel for two wake up calls, and neither of them came. So, of course, last night I was like, oh my God. But I had all kinds of, you know, fail safes, people knocking on the door and stuff. But, it doesn't have to be something that dramatic. It can be all these little things, right? Like the user is uh, listening to something about the product or they're looking at the manual, they're watching your little simple video for getting started and there's just something that's kind of back there nagging them a little bit. Yeah, but they didn't, admit, but what if, right? And then they go, well, now, okay, that's okay. They didn't mention it. I guess it's not a problem, right? Well, the brain is like, okay, well, nice that you can relax, but I'm not letting it go. So, and, and there's a psychological effect called the Zigernick effect. I don't know if I'm actually pronouncing that right. But it's where when there's an open thread, the brain keeps it open. Even if you think consciously that you have 
closed it, your brain is still back there leaking cycles, worrying about it. And you can imagine how many of these happen. So this is death by a thousand, of, a thousand cognitive micro leaks, right? Just that tiny little thing. You walk in the theater. I did put my phone on silent, right? Yeah, of course I did. Yes, of course I did. I did, right? Right? And pretty soon, it adds up to a big pool. So this is a great book by Dan Saffer. Anybody read this book? Micro interactions is a great book, and it talks about um, those tiny little interactions for um, uh, user interface and user experience. And of course, a lot of it is just giving really clean, clear feedback that the person can trust so that they can close that leak and their brain can let it go. Um, so I highly recommend that book. So a fix for these Zigernick effect leaks, these things where it's an open thread that's just running back there, is to give the brain a reason to feel completely confident, right? So when this happens, there's an answer, and it looks like this, for example. Do you guys know what this is? This is clocky. This is, an, this is a real thing. This is an alarm clock that rolls off the table, and you have to go in. You can't reach out, right? It's gone. So you have to get up. You have to get up. So you know that if you've got a clocky, right? So clocky says, don't worry. I've got that you will get up, right? I just thought there's another one that's like a carpet, a little piece of carpet, and you have to like run over and stand on the carpet. And then I saw one where like, you have to like shoot a little laser gun to hit a target. So, it, and if you don't hit it, it keeps, anyway. There's lots of ways to get the brain to think you're going to get up, right? So then the brain goes, whew, it's handled. So it's not that you're already up that lets the brain go, whoo, it's handled. The brain can let go of this if it knows that you really trust in what's going to happen. So then the brain goes, all right, it's clear that you're completely relaxed about it. Clocky's got this. I'm okay. I don't have to worry about it now. So uh, obviously giving clear feedback is a huge way to help with that. But this is the big one. This is the one we have to care about the most. And it's the one where we can make a difference really easily if we are willing to try it. This is what we have to fix, is that we act to our users as if this doesn't happen for them. We just pretend. And when we pretend, when we are definitely not transparent, whether we're just trying to talk ourselves into believing that the experience of using our product, or we say, hey, using our product is easy. Yeah, the context is hard, but we don't have anything to do with that. That's not our responsibility. Well, it is if you want people to use your product and talk to other people about it. We have to care about all of it. So if we act like this is not happening, then we've drained our users' cognitive resources in so many different ways. So we act like, at the time they're using the product, this is who they are. From the user's perspective, this is what they think you think they are. Because this is how we talk to them, after they've bought the product, actually. Not before. Before, oh my god, you're so busy. But when they're using the product, this is how they are. We treat them as though this is true. And here he is with his credit card. This is how we treat them. <laughs> this is how we act, right? When this is what they're actually feeling. But we don't want to acknowledge that. Not acknowledging that is the worst thing that we can do. Because this is really, this is, yeah, this is the best case scenario, is that he just thinks he's stupid, right? Because it's not that they're struggling, having taught programming for a very long time, um, it's not that they're struggling, it's when we act as though nobody else struggles, right? Everyone else is good with it, um, then it's their problem. They either think they are crazy or an idiot or both, or they hate you or all of the above. Right? So it's not just that we left them with a difficult to read manual that doesn't get past the brain spam filter and has nothing to do with the context. It's not that we did that. I mean, that's bad enough. But it's that we act as though, what's the problem? <laughs> Everyone else is good with it, right? And that's the worst hit of all. The one where they actually feel like there's something wrong with them for having this experience. And we could close those leaks by, of course, making the product easier and better and perfect, right? But that's not going to happen. Because even if we fix our product, we still haven't fixed the bigger context. And 
if we have something really interesting, a lot of times some things just are hard, and it's really useful to acknowledge that. In fact, some of the best things that are most meaningful for people are hard. And there's nothing we can really do about that. So if we can't do this, and because some things are just hard, right? And it's hard, the tool could be hard, but the compelling context is definitely going to be hard, even if we fix our tool. So the best way to close leaks is give them a reason to believe that you get it, that you understand what they're going through. Because the two best words a user can hear when they're struggling is that this is totally typical, totally temporary. Yes, it's awful right now. Everyone goes through this. Here's what's going to happen. That's all they have to hear. The problem is not the struggle. And then when we try to pretend, oh, God, we don't want to plant the seed, like we act like, but if we mention that it's going to be hard, then they'll know. And it's like, they know. <laughs> they already know it's hard. Um, it suddenly doesn't become easier because we try to pretend like it's not. It's a struggle. And again, even if our tool is really easy, it's perfectly, um, uh, it's perfectly valid to say, yes, we know that we've made this easy for you, but that you really are using it to do something else, and that's the thing that matters. So does our user interface, does our marketing, does our support, does our manual, does it reflect what they're actually thinking? And what would happen if you did? Because we know that this is not what they're actually thinking. But we act like it is, and they think that that's what we think. So this is a thought experiment you could do, not right now, but imagine what he's actually feeling. And now, what would you change? What could you change in your user interface? Not to make that not happen, but to make it clear that you know it is happening. So you obviously want to reduce it wherever you can, but there are some leaks you can't close. Some things are just hard. So, how can we let the user know that we get it? So I'm not suggesting that you actually do this, but you could, is you could add a button <laughs> on your interface. Now, think about what that would say to the user if the user at any time just gets to click, right? And in fact, some software has done that. There was a, um, there was a, a web service called Wasabi. It actually isn't around anymore, but not because of this. This was the one thing everybody loved. It was a financial program for, for people. And it had an I'm freaking out button. And um, over and over again, users said that was the most comforting thing that they had ever experienced. Because it let them know it's totally appropriate to be freaking out. I mean, there's a button. So it must be OK. It must be something other people do. Um, the button doesn't even have to actually be helpful. It just having it there sends a really important message to people that closes a lot of leaks. The, uh, I think this is the new Kindle Fire has this, I don't have one, but it, up there it has a May Day button. So it looks like a little, I don't know, life preserver. Anyway, so it has this May Day button and you click it, boom, instant connection. And now, as of June 13th, Amazon said, this is what's happening. So what you can do is just tell users every way that you can. Just tell them. We get it. We understand. We know what this is like. But it's going to be OK. Because we are there to get you through it. We'll help you get through it. Here's some places where you can go to get through it. Because right? then they'll feel that way. This is what you want them to think, not I'm an idiot. And then the brain goes, cool, it's handled. These people know that this is supposed to be hard. And there's nothing wrong with me. So, But we have this one last problem, which is even if we've done our part, the rest of the user's life is draining their cognitive resources. We can't act like something happens to them magically once they start using our product. Right? So everything in their life is competing for their cognitive resources and competing hard. See all these books? There's about a zillion books like this. They're all designed to tell you or other people how to consume as many cognitive resources as possible from other people. For good or bad, often bad. But this is what's happening, right? And there's a zillion of them, like I said, and there's maybe one or two, maybe, that help people figure out how to not have their resources consumed. So and these, these are who you're competing with, right? Because everyone is trying to drain your user's cognitive resources. And their resources that are drained, they're drained, right? This is the entire internet. 
The entire internet is the biggest cognitive resource drain there could possibly be, right? Kids, big, big cognitive resource drain. So life is a cognitive resource drain, and we pretend that it's not for our users. So how many of you use personas? You create personas for your users, right? So we describe the user, the, this is the busy mom, you know, the stressed out, whatever. We do those to help understand who our user is, but then once they actually become our user and they sit down to use the product, we forget that this is who they are and we act like they're this guy. So we write the persona for this person, but then somehow when they start using the product, the moment they're touching it, it's like none of those things matter. And they all still matter. So we have to think about it. Because the moment they sit down, they don't suddenly regain cognitive resources. So we have to care about the whole context that they're in, right? This is who we think they are, people who actually smile and are happy while moving, right? <laughs> Look, here's our user, he's getting a massage. He has a family, and a cute cat, and a cute kid, right? This is how we think of our users while they're actually using the product. We think they are stock photography people. So, but it's not true, right? This guy, his wife has another family. <laughs> That's what his cat actually looks like. That baby actually looks like that. Stock photography people. So, that this guy is your user, the chances of that happening are the same as this guy is your customer <laughs> service person. Why do you think that? Right. So, don't treat users like stock photography people. Think about their giant resource drain. But here's the awesome thing. If we think from a cognitive resources perspective, we can help their whole entire life, right? We might not make their cat nicer or their baby not cry, Right? We might not make them you know, able to actually laugh and smile when they move. But if we can help them have just a few more opportunities to choose fruit instead of cake by the choices that we make and by how we acknowledge, right, we can actually help them have a few more cognitive resources to spend on the things they really do care about, like their actual family, both of their families. Um, so I'm going to end how I always end, which is, it's such an honor to be in an environment where we can make a positive impact on people's lives in a pretty dramatic way. And thank you all for your time and the cognitive resources that you've spent listening to me. Thank you.